Hello everyone, and congratulations, you have just completed your very first model. And wow, modeling is not as easy as it seems, right? But with appropriate guidance and systematic steps, you all succeeded. So let's recapitulate what you did. These are how the 10 steps you went through fit together in the big picture cycle of model-driven discovery. You started off with experimental data describing the phenomenon of illusory self and world motion. Since the phenomenon was not understood, you wanted to gain insight by modeling it. And you might have already had some ideas to start you off. But first you needed to frame your question more precisely. So you did your background research and learned about the phenomenon of illusory self motion or illusory world motion. You researched visual and vestibular processing and learned what variables and other ingredients you might need. Then you learned how to use those to formulate a specific hypothesis. Through that process, you also refined your question and modeling goals. So these were the first four steps of modeling. Those are arguably the most important steps. If you get those right, there is little room for failure because you have a precise target and specific goals to reach. With that groundwork done, you learned how to first outline and then implement the model. You learned how to specify links between variables so that you could detect self-motion. And you might have noticed that model implementation was relatively speaking easier than framing the question. The reason for that is that you did a good job framing the question. Without that, you would have not known where to start and what to do. Then you performed model testing. You first asked whether your model was complete. Could it answer your research question? And could it test your hypothesis? Note that if you didn't have a precisely formulated hypothesis and question, it would have been much harder for you to evaluate whether you were done modeling. Now, once that was verified, you learned how to do basic model evaluation with respect to the data and rudimentary model comparison to evaluate which alternative model or hypothesis described the data best. And finally, you learned how to write a clear and concise summary of your modeling project. Here you focused on what's important to communicate. Note that again, the groundwork you have done by framing the question made this step particularly easy. Now, part of framing the question is to precisely define the problem space. In your project, you have asked why this illusion occurs and whether it could be explained by unreliable vestibular signals. But you could have asked many different questions. For example, in which situation this phenomenon occurs, which, going back to yesterday's lesson, would have been a descriptive what question. Or you could have asked about the neuronal mechanisms leading to this illusion, which would have been a how question. And for each of those different questions, you would, could formulate many different hypotheses. For example, for the descriptive question, we could hypothesize its window size or speed or weather conditions that matter. And each of those hypotheses would be potentially meaningful for a series of different goals. For example, examining window size could be interesting in the quest to reduce nausea, or maybe you're interested in window design, or what processing characteristics in visual cortex lead to this illusion. Those are all reasonable questions, hypotheses, and goals. But every one path taken, every combination of these, would lead to a different model. Precisely defining your problem space thus defines and constrains the actual modeling project and helps ensure success. It is thus crucial to specify the problem space because it represents the knowledge gap we would like to fill. The thing we do not understand yet and that we would like our model to shine light on. Importantly, by thinking about the problem space and our goals, you also have incorporated what you personally care about as an individual. It defines what the utility of the model will be for you. 
And since we all have different motivations and goals, this results in many complementary and new perspectives that all contribute meaningfully to scientific progress. And as Megan has already introduced earlier, we really do all care about different things in modeling. Okay, so we have the problem space defined and you have your goal set. What you need now is a model that links both. In other words, precisely defining the problem space and desired outcomes, the goals alongside with why this is useful for you, you now have all the information necessary to make the best possible model choice. Without such precise constraints, choosing the right modeling approach would be hard. Remember the universe of different models that we talked about yesterday? So deciding on the best model to use becomes a highly constrained decision process. Instead of having to arbitrarily choose from all possible kinds of models, you typically end up with a small set of possibilities. Sometimes no particular type of existing models is appropriate and you have to invent your own. Sometimes you have a few reasonable choices and you have to decide which one might be best. For example, which one would allow best generalization to other experiments? Which one would be most elegant, etc. This is where your subjective preferences come in and this is part of where model diversity happens and matters. Okay, so now we know how to model. That looks fairly straightforward, right? Well, in practice, it looks more like this. There is a constant back and forth in framing the question between researching the ingredients, the background knowledge, coming up with good hypotheses, trying to figure out what a good question is. Has this already been done in the field? Is this meaningful in terms of the outcome? And only when we have a good question that is precise and concrete, can we move on to the actual modeling exercise where we start drafting based on the toolkit we have selected, implementing the model, along the way testing each element of the model in the unit tests, and even there, it can happen that our initial draft was wrong and we have to revise it because the implementation does not show the behavior we expect. Maybe we have even selected the wrong toolkit and so we have to go back and forth. Now, even that is often not as straightforward as depicted. So let me tell you a story about modeling from my own research. This story is about a project that has fascinated me since the beginning of my PhD, namely how the brain decides when to execute saccades during smooth pursuit eye movements of moving target, something we do all the time, every day. So this picture depicts young me as a PhD student with my amazing PhD advisor, Philippe Lefebvre, and a just as amazing collaborator, Jean-Louis Tonard getting ready to board an Airbus A300-0G for parabolic flight experiments, testing the role of gravity in motor coordination. And while that's, a, while that's a slightly different story, the coordination between saccades and smooth pursuit is also a motor coordination problem involving two different motor systems in the brain, saccade and pursuit motor systems, that both drive the same effector, which is the eyeball. So what are saccades? Saccades are these rapid reorienting eye movements that make the eye like jump around in angular position. And pursuits are these nice smooth tracking movements here of a sinusoidal target that are not jerky at all like the saccades. So let me give you a real life example of where this happens. Here we have recorded a spectator's eye movements while they're watching a squash game. We have then overlaid the eye movement trace in red. That trace is composed of little dots placed where the eye was at every video frame here at 60 Hertz. So if the dots are close together and blend together in the streak of eye position history, then you have a smooth pursuit tracking eye movement or fixation if the dot is immobile. But sometimes you have these rapid shifts of, eye, of the eye called saccades. And you can see them when the dots space out. 
and those saccades are interspersed with the ongoing smooth tracking eye movement. So what does this look like in slow motion? You can see that the participants track the squash ball, or at least attempt to track the squash ball, fairly well. But they often fall behind and have to initiate a quick reorienting catch-up saccades in order to be back on the target. So important background knowledge is that you have clear vision during smooth eye movements, but reduced blurred vision during saccades. So you want to minimize the occurrence of saccades. At the same time, since sensory processing and movement execution takes a minimum amount of processing time in the brain, this processing delay often results in the eye falling behind the target we want to track. The only way to catch up to the target is then to decide to make a saccade. So we have a trade-off between tolerating tracking error and having reduced vision during saccades. This was part of our background knowledge. So the question is, how does the brain decide when a saccade should be executed? When analyzing conditions that led to saccades and comparing them to conditions without saccades, we found this very nice experimental relationship. Under the assumption of constant tracking speed, no saccade was triggered um, if the extrapolated eye position trace would meet the target position trace within a small window of times, roughly between 40 and 200 milliseconds. This eye crossing time, TXE, can easily be estimated by computing the negative fraction of the position error, PE, which is the difference between target and eye angular position, and the retinal slip, RS, which is the difference between target and eye angular velocity. And you can see here the dip of the occurrence of saccades in this interval between 40 and 200 milliseconds. So this was a very nice finding and we published it right away back in 2002. But when trying to model it to find the mechanism underlying the saccade trigger decision, we dug a bit deeper and we found something that we had no idea or intuition how to explain mechanistically. And that was that the saccade trigger time distributions changed as a function of specific parameter combinations, not just the eye crossing time TXE. So you can see here the eye position as a function of time in a solid trace and the target position that the eye tries to track in a dotted trace. And there is an instantaneous step in position and velocity, so instantaneous change in position, instantaneous change in velocity of the target that the eye tries to react to. If that change to so the step in position and velocity is both directed in the same direction, you get a very nice short latency saccade histogram. But if they go in opposite directions, position error and retinal slip go in opposite directions, then you have um, a much broader and longer latency saccade distribution. And this becomes even more dramatic when in these cases where the eye almost catches up to the target with purely smooth pursuit eye movements, but not quite. So what we needed as ingredients to model this was a way to describe this variability of movements and decisions but we did not have the tools for that in the field. So we never published this data. As another piece of background in the puzzle, it must be said that up to very recently, all eye movement models were deterministic. They came from a tremendous tradition of electrical engineering approaches introduced to the field in the 1950s and 60s by the late David A. Robinson. They relied on linear systems theory, something you'll learn about in week two and looked like this. In this model of saccadic eye movements, there is a description of how the eye moves, characterized by second order dynamics of the eye plant on the right here, um, and specified in Laplace notation, and don't worry, it doesn't, it's not really important. And certain other boxes in the model and arrows that depict information transformations and flow. 
The red labels correspond to different well-known eye movement control structures in the brain. And in fact, the success of this kind of model is that individual operations in this model, mathematical operations, could be directly ascribed to specific brain areas. But importantly, in this model, for the same input, which is an error to the target, you always get the same output, a saccade. But this could not capture the variability or even changes of variability across parameter sets that we observed in the data. So we were stuck. And for years, we continued working on other questions while always having this un unanswered trigger problem nagging us in the back of our minds. Then in 2005, Leslie Osborne showed that smooth pursuit variability was not modern noise as previously thought. Instead, as the comparison between model and data shows on the right here, pursuit variability could be much better captured by sensory variability driving the pursuit system. Around the same time, the tide was shifting in another research field that I started to become really interested in, and that is arm movement planning and control. In fact, Emmanuel Todorov introduced optimal feedback control to describe arm movements. You will learn about this next week too. In this framework, a controller uses the current estimate of the system's state to produce motor commands. The important part for our purpose here is that sensory and motor signals in this framework are considered to be corrupted by noise and thus have to be estimated from noisy signals. And this uses a particular statistical approach, the Bayesian approach, that you'll learn about next week as well. So these findings made their way in our brains until one day at the Society for Neuroscience uh, annual meeting in 2010, on a rooftop terrace in San Diego, Philippe Lefebvre, Jean-Jacques Orban de Xivry and I had a simultaneous epiphany. We need to abandon the idea that we can model the saccade trigger mechanism deterministically using the traditional eye movement models. Instead, we realized that we had not properly thought about our toolkit selection process. We needed statistical tools to explain the saccade trigger mechanism. In other words, we wanted a statistical description of a decision mechanism, when to trigger a saccade during smooth pursuit, that is based on a statistical description of saccades and smooth pursuit generation. But remember, there was no such thing. All eye movement models were deterministic, so we first needed to build a stochastic smooth pursuit model. This is what's shown here, where both sensory processing in red and internal motor memories in blue were considered to be statistical estimates, including uncertainty, and thus movement generation in black produced variability in the output. We evaluated this model against all existing data, as you should, and, performed, and it performed extremely well. But importantly, it also made a few predictions that we and others tested experimentally on the way. One of those predictions was that repeated movements should generate prior expectations of motions that influence the smooth pursuit eye movement response to an abruptly moving target. And this has been independently tested by Timothy Darlington from Steven Lisberger's group and Nicolas Derave from our group though Timothy was a bit faster than us, so they got published in a better journal. On the flip side though, it's great to see independent validation by another group, which has also proved that this is important work. And the data here shows that pursuit depends on trial history for different monkeys and different stimulus conditions. So now we had a stochastic pursuit model. We also needed to build a stochastic saccade model, but that turned out to be too simple to be published alone. So we just waited for the saccade trigger model to come along. And that model was finally ready in 2019. And as you can see from the citation, it is still not published in a peer reviewed journal. Although I think we're getting close. How does this model work? It takes in noisy sensory information, estimates it, by common filtering and light green. It then predicts expected future errors 
and computes and integrates the log likelihood ratio of the probability of the target being outside the fovea in the near future. That's done in dark green. And when the threshold is met, so when this probability of the target being outside the fovea is high, we trigger a saccade during ongoing smooth pursuit and both saccadic and pursuit motor commands are added up as shown in gray. So this model explicitly reproduces the main features of the data I showed you earlier. And since that was our goal, we had finally completed our modeling journey. By the way, this model also made predictions that we have already published, the world upside down. So to summarize this process, it took us 20 years from the initial investigation of the Saka trigger mechanisms that we published in 2002 to where we are today. It required a lot of time thinking to get to the epiphany that we had to abandon the traditional deterministic approaches for a fully statistical approach, then several steps in modeling and experimental validation. On top of that, I should say that this is not a done project. We're still interested in continuing researching, for example, the role of prediction in saccade triggering, or how you trigger saccades to accelerating targets, which happens all the time. But I hope that this description of the higher level modeling process showed you how science really works. It's an often unpredictable, exciting and fun adventure with a constant interplay between models and experiments. So to conclude, I would like to give you my modeling vision. We have seen that you can decompose modeling into 10 manageable steps. And although it might not always be as straightforward as you did during the tutorials, you should always try to do this. But often there are missing pieces and a simple little model project turns into half a career goal or more. But that's great for science, right? It's fun, it's meaningful, and big projects leave a bigger mark. Finally, I would like to say that modeling should always accompany your scientific endeavors. It grounds us and forces us to think things through. With that, I wish you best success in modeling and lots of fun during your projects. Thank you.